Oh, tradition. Cannot be a How's that? Yes, now I'm fine. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so this is the traditional way that we uh, write the uh, uh, the Schwarzschild uh, space time, the one that will, of course, be the space time of a, of a black hole. And the problem appears. Okay, so let me get this. So now it's not advancing. Ah, there we go. Good. Thank you. Uh, and the problem appears here. Uh, this quantity uh, diverges at the Schwarzschild radius. We, we all know that. And so the idea is that maybe there's some sort of a singularity there. This is the, uh, this is this, the full Schwarzschild solution. I plotted it very carefully in Grusgal coordinates. So this is actually geometrically accurate in the, in the way that you would expect. And so if you take that seriously uh, as some kind of a singularity, you'd say there has to be a singularity roughly here where all the uh, coordinate, uh, all, all the T surfaces of, of this expression for the line element meet. And of course, you know, the first thing you learn if you take a, uh, you know, of uh, course, in general, utilities. No, no, no. There's no singularity there. Um, uh, why would you? Why would you think otherwise? Who would think otherwise? Well, you know the answer to, to the question of who would think otherwise. Uh, it's uh, this guy, Einstein, and I'm going to draw on the paper that Einstein and Rosen wrote in 1935. If you're thinking 1935 is pretty late in the game, yes, it is. A lot has happened uh, already. Lemaitre has found, uh, you know, has, has published uh, an analysis that says there's no real singularity there. Um, Einstein and Rosen uh, truly don't care. Here they've written the expression for the, uh, the line element, and this is what they say. Uh, G11 for R is 2M, fractal radius becomes infinite, and hence we have there a singularity. Okay, so this is the mistake everyone's told not to make. Einstein and Rosen are making it. Einstein does this repeatedly. Right, so I want to give you another example. This when is. Was the oh, I think it was 1922 20, or 32. Um, um, I now I'm now blocking on the on the precise reference. I guess probably more like 32. Yeah. And it's not really until the until the 60s. Uh, Finkelstein, Kruskal, Zekeresh, that you know that. That this becomes a mainstream view. Certainly, around this time, people are still very much thinking uh, thinking this way. Right. Okay, so this is the De Sitter space time. Uh, it was introduced by uh, De Sitter in, uh, uh, in in 1917. Uh, here's the De Sitter space time written in what's known as static coordinates. Uh, you have exactly the same thing happening. Here are the static coordinates represented on the uh, on the De Sitter hyperboloid. You have a divergence. Of, uh, sorry, you have a vanishing of this term here. So the uh, determinant of the, of the metric is kind of going to go to zero, and that's that's where where problems come in. So uh, maybe there's a singularity right here. Uh, of course, the diagram says it all. No, there's not a singularity right there. Who would think otherwise? Well, you know the answer. Um, it's Einstein. Einstein has been in very energetic correspondence with De Sitter for over a year at this point, and he feels the need. This is now a paper published in 1918. He feels the need to, to, to give a, a statement of this is my view of, uh, of the situation. And he describes that here in this paper, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, it's too small to read and it's in German, so that'll, that's double problems. Um, and he says very clearly, there's a discontinuity there that cannot be eliminated through any choice of coordinates, right? Which you want to say, well, but we just saw the figure, and, you know. Um, but he's de he's denying that, um, and then until proven otherwise, it is therefore to be assumed that the Sitter solution has a real singularity uh, in, uh, in 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 that in that surface. Okay, so I, that's the problem that I've set up, and I take it you're all thinking, didn't he know, right? Didn't didn't he know um, that you know a coordinate system can go bad if if you set up your 
uh, level surfaces of the t-coordinate such that they all intersect at a point. Um, uh, of course, things are going to go funny, but it's just a bad coordinate system. Didn't he? Didn't he know that? And uh, and uh, you know, and uh, didn't he know that you can regularly extend these? And in particular, uh, in the case of the uh, De Sitter space time, it is one of the most regular space times you can get in general relativity. It's the uh, it's the four dimensional um, uh, analog of a, a, of a sphere, right? It, it's homogeneous everywhere. Everywhere is the same. You can't have a singularity here without having it everywhere, right? So didn't didn't he know? But he probably also didn't know that, right? He didn't know the symmetry group. He did. That's okay. the next thing. That's what I'm going to show you now. He knew. He knew all of this. Sorry, I'm still building the puzzle. <laughs> it's going to get stranger, stranger, and stranger. So, um, in order to give you a sense that there's really something very different going on here, I want to go back to the Einstein Rosen paper of 1935. Uh, the purpose of that paper is actually to advocate for an alteration to the gravitational field equations that will get rid of exactly these sorts of singularities. So he has to explain what are the bad guys, the singularities that he wants to get rid of. And he picks an example that we would think now is so completely transparent that it's a jaw drop to think that he thinks that this is a singularity, right? So let's have a look at the case. And the case is he takes a Minkowski space time, he goes to what are in effect born hyperbolic coordinates. We now know them as Rindler coordinates because of the, you know, because Rindler has, made, has um, introduced them in a very useful way into the later literature. Uh, in those coordinates, you get this beautifully simple expression for the um, uh, for the line element. It only, only covers this part of of of, uh, of, of the wedge in a uh, in a Minkowski space time. The, um, well, you, you will know what, where it is there. And you, you have a similar problem. Uh, you have this term here goes to zero. So you have a vanishing of the uh, determinant of the, uh, of the metric tensor. And so when you start pumping that through the formalism, you get all sorts of bad quantities appearing. And so you, and so you have a singularity, all right? So, and that's exactly what they say. This is singular, all right? So here's the, here's the text. Um, he's talking about a special kind of singularity. He wants, the details of how he goes about the removal is, is unimportant here. There's the, uh, there's the, uh, there's the line element. Um, he's got the, uh, um, the Einstein source free field equations here and even the vanishing of the Riemann uh, tensor there. And he says, from the standpoint of equation three, right, um, the hyperplane X1 equals zero then, then represents a singularity in the field. Okay, how could he say that? Could it get any worse? I could, just think for a moment, could it get any worse? Yes, <laughs> now it's gonna get worse. He says, there's a singularity as an infinite mass concentration there, right? So what's going on here? So this is the relevant part of the Einstein-Rosen paper. And what they do is, what Einstein and Rosen do is something that's routinely done in general relativity. Uh, you can take the Einstein gravitational field equations with a stress energy tensor in there, and you read it in that direction. Right? You put in the metric on this side and you figure out what sort of mass distribution lives on the, on, on the other side. Right? And that's exactly what they do. It's a little bit complicated because, he's, because he thinks he's got a uh, he's got a divergence of quantities at, at x1 is equal to zero. So they have to be a little bit fancy about it. So they produce a limiting argument. Um, I won't go through the details because it's pretty straightforward. And when the limiting argument is over, they say from the standpoint of the original theory, the solution one, that's the one we saw at the beginning, contains a singularity which corresponds to an energy or mass concentration on the surface. Okay, now remember, this is all in a Minkowski space time. That all, all of this, all of this is happening. And this is 1935. It's Einstein and Rosen together. It's pretty late on, right? Um, yes, he knows all of the things that you're thinking. D does he? Does do they know that the coordinate system doesn't cover the whole the whole space time? Yes, they they know that. This is a footnote at the bottom of the first page, right? And it, it's it's very clear. You know, here's the here's the transformation to the hyperbolic, the the the, the Rindler coordinates. Right, and uh, then then they say very clearly uh, that it follows that the, that the new coordinates only cover right um, a part of the uh, Minkowski uh, space. It's the same temperature, no? Where is where is the temperature? 
when and the actions. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's this slice of right here. He was trying to get placed to the right side. Um, well, this goes back to 1907. Einstein has a, you know, has, um, has a weak method slice of this hyperbolic slice. Um, well, Vaughan's dissertation then in Göttingen in 1908 actually has all this in it already. So, I mean, this is just standard geometry that's been, that's been known from, from the, uh, 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 from 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 the from the very beginning. Okay, so all right. Now, what about the dissonant hyperboloid? Let's go take the other case. Yes, Einstein, without any question, knew about the full dissonant hyperboloid. So, how do we know this? Well, remember, I said that Einstein and Dissida had been in very energetic correspondence prior to the writing of the paper that I showed you earlier. Right? And so that correspondence has an early point, which is Einstein's 1917 uh, universe. The Einstein universe was introduced in this paper in 1917. You know the geometry of Einstein's universe. It's sometimes called the cylinder universe. That is, it's uh, static in time. And if you take a, um, a single couple slice, you get a, uh, you get a three-dimensional space that's uh, closed and spherical. So there's a fairly mechanical question. How are we going to get the geometry of that of that uh, spherical space surface of a of a of a, of a three a four dimensional sphere if, if you like? And Einstein has a calculation. It's completely Thank ordinary, you. completely boring in the paper that looks like this. He says to get the, the geometry of just that sphere, the spatial geometry of the sphere, we're going to move up one dimension to a four dimensional uh, uh, Euclidean space. We're then going to embed into that a three-dimensional sphere, which looks like this. And then it's a mechanical thing to figure out what is the geometry that's induced by the higher dimension of Euclidean space onto that sphere. Right? And you end up with the line element that is restricted just, just, to, the, uh, just to that sphere. Okay, I take it, I take it that's, yeah, of course, what, that's, that's the easy way to do it. Why would you do it any, any way differently? Now, the point is, that's exactly what De Sitter does in 1917 when he introduces the De Sitter space time. Right? It's introduced in, in, in this paper. He very consciously mimics exactly Einstein's derivation, and he makes no secret that that's what he's doing. Right? I'll show you the relevant bit of the paper. I you know, just snipped out the bit of the paper in which he does the work. He's got two columns, right, which is difficult to do in hot metal. You know, time setting, but he wants his two columns, and on the left, very consciously, he's got. You know, he's saying, um, "This is Einstein's calculation, right? I'm doing exactly the same thing in four dimensions, right? And he's using ICT, so he's really he's really got a hypersphere with these funny ICT coordinates. Um, of course, you don't have to use ICT if you just use CT. You've got a hyperboloid. Uh, did he know that? Uh, yes." Uh, it's it, it's in a it's in a footnote, right? He says you can also do it this other way, but he wants to keep the analogy going well with with Einstein. So if Einstein saw all of this, he surely understands that the Sitter solution has this very regular hyperboloid. How could he how could he not? And so maybe it's possible that Einstein just missed this. He didn't maybe he didn't read everything. No chance, no way. We know this because the Sitter wrote out the whole calculation by hand. And mailed it to Einstein, right? So, so he's got it. Okay. At this point, if I've if i if I've done my my job well, you're all thinking, what the heck, right? Um, and I guess at this point, some of you are going to think I don't care anymore. Um, but does anyone you want to know what I think the answer to this is? I mean, yes. <laughs> Why does the stress transfer not vanish from sigma into zero? I'll come to it. Okay. Um, um, yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah. You, you'll, 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 you'll see it. You'll see it in a moment. Um, so let me tell you, there is a solution, and the solution depends essentially on understanding that Einstein's methods were dramatically different from the methods that we that we now use, and he he chose them consciously. He did not he did not uh, choose them through ignorance. He consciously rejected the sort of thing that we now do. That frankly, 
has been a great deal more, more fertile. So let me try and capture the difference between what we now do and, uh, and, 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 and what Einstein was doing. So this is the way that, that we now do things. We have essentially two pieces that I'll put together. We have this idea of the geometry of a space time. This is, which one is that? That's the, that's the uh, Schwarzschild space time and Kruzko coordinates. And then we have analytic expressions. Right? The analytic expressions are useful as ways of describing the properties of that, of that geometry, right? But they're, but they're secondary. The big deal is the geometry, and we use the analytic expressions as ways of getting at the geometry. If something, something goes wrong, right? Um, if there's something weird in these expressions, we go back to the geometry and say, okay, what's happening here? And you can use the geometry to correct the analytic expressions. And that's what we've been doing uh, all along here. Um, if you find the coordinates are going bad, well, don't use those coordinates. It's a simple solution, right? You just replace them with a, uh, with a better analy analytic expression. Einstein does it the other way around. Right? He flips that. That's the key to the way that, that, he, uh, that he saw things. So for Einstein, the analytic expression is the primary thing. This is the guy uh, that he cares about. Right? And you can use the geometry. It's a secondary thing. It's a kind of heuristic that helps you get to these expressions. But these expressions are the theory. The geometric pictures are just, are just useful aids, useful helps to, uh, that are going to get you there. If you're thinking... How, how can that be? Well, you've already seen one example of that. When Einstein had to recover the, the geometry of a, spherically, uh, of, a, of, a, of a spherical space, he had this completely fictional four-dimensional Euclidean space, right? And then he inferred from that. The last thing you would, you would want to do in that calculation is take that four-dimensional space seriously. It's simply a useful adjunct that lets you create the thing that you want, the line element for that spherical space. Right. So that's the attitude that Einstein has over and over again. Geometry is nice, but it's useful only as a heuristic aid to get us to these expressions. They're the things that really matter. So what happens when there's a conflict? Well, it's not entirely clear what you should do when there's a conflict. You have to look for further conditions. Sometimes the geometry is going to tell you the right thing to do. And there's at least one case where Einstein follows the geometry. But in all the cases that interest us, it goes in the other direction. When there's a tension between these two, Einstein then finds the physical reasons are going to guide him to, to prefer the analytic uh, expression. Right? I'll try and give you some examples of that uh, 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 in, 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 in a bit. Right? You'll see how that, how that works. Um, now, the main thing to see here is that you know, nowadays we think of general relativity as a geometric theory. How, how else would you think about it? Well, Einstein did not think that way at all. Uh, the, I think the best work on this has been done by Dennis Lemkul in a paper 2014. He really laid out that Einstein was, was not just um, not a geometrical thinker, but he was very actively um, hostile to the idea of a geometric approach. Once you go looking for it, you can see this. Um, it's all the way through. You find remarks here and there. This is just an example of, of one of them. Uh, he's in correspondence with Hans Reichenberg uh, in the 1920s about how the vials work. Uh, and, uh, and he talks about, you know, people are talking about general relativity as geometrizing gravity, and he just hates the idea. So you get a sense of the antipathy if you just start reading the quote here. It is preposterous to believe that geometrization means something essential. It is for me a kind of novice aid for the discovery of numerical laws. Whether one attaches a geometric conce conception to a theory is an inessential private matter. And then he talks a bit about um, about him and I mean, that was, his, that was his attitude towards Minkowski when he first yeah. met, met. But then he, you know, by 1907, he, he starts to think this, he actually needs this. Yes. But the question, question which I'll answer in the next slide is, but precisely what did he need? Okay. That, that's uh, that's the thing. I just this term Azel Azel Brook Donkey Bridge, by the way, is one that I found just historically intriguing. Um, uh, it has resonance with a thing called the Pons Asinorum in history of geometry. If anyone's interested in these weird things, we can talk a bit, a bit about that. Okay, so once you realize that Einstein is not a geometrical thinker, 
but he's very much algebraic. It's, you know, it's all the equations that matter to him, the variables and the symbols. You, you can find all the way through his work, there were clues to it, the way that he taught. I just want to show you a few of those to give you a sense of, of what that looked like. Uh, when we're in the geometrical mode, we talk about coordinates and the transformation of coordinates because we're thinking about this fixed geometrical object and sort of moving the coordinates around, rotating them or doing other, other, other things to them. Einstein typically talks that way, but every now and again, and in important places, he slips into the language of variables and substitutions of variables. All right, so he's thinking about the algebraic expression. Well, you see it in another place. These are just a few of very many places like this, and I can't, can't go through all of them. We nowadays talk about the vanishing of the Riemann curvature tensor as being necessary and sufficient for the flatness of space-time. Right, that's just a just you know that's what it is. That isn't how he talked. Right? If you look at what he says, he, first, he doesn't call it the curvature tensor. He doesn't like any kind of geometrical thought. It is the vanishing of the riemann christoffel tensor. And it is the necessary and sufficient condition for an algebraic fact that if you have a metric tensor, you can transform all of its uh, coefficients to constants. Then there's Minkowski, right? To answer, answer Peter's uh, question. So what did Minkowski do? Well, Minkowski showed us that special relativity can be thought of as the geometry of a pseudo-Euclidean spacetime. Right? That's just the way it's always, it's always presented. What did Einstein say Minkowski has, had achieved? Right? What was Minkowski's contribution? He says very little about Minkowski, but when he does say it, this is what he says. Right? Um, he says, or perhaps I won't read the whole thing. He showed us uh, that time can enter into the equations in a way that's very similar to the ordinary spatial coordinates, right? It's a, it's a property of expressions that, that, are, that are being used. He calls it a purely formal addition uh, uh, to, to, our, to our knowledge. Okay, so the, that's the difference of view. Now let's try and work out. I'll try and answer your question about, so how, how can you have a, you know, how can you have a diverging stress energy tensor in a matter-free space time? How does, how does that happen? So let me go through a, a few pieces about how this uh, approach is going to be developed. Uh, the first thing is to get clear on what he means by um, a, uh, um, a, 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 a singularity. And we can thank Hilbert for giving us a very precise definition. Einstein used a similar definition. Uh, but uh, Hilbert, David Hilbert, uh, you know, the greatest mathematician of the era in Göttingen pays attention to relativity and starts writing about it. Um, he published two papers, Die Grundlagen der Physik, the foundations of, of physics in 1916. These are in the history of relativity theory, immensely important because they bring mathematical precision to a lot of the stuff that Einstein was doing. Um, they're uniformly supportive of, of, uh, of Einstein's work. Uh, you'll find in them uh, the first clear statement of the initial value problem. Um, and just because, you know, Hilbert and Göttingen was the mathematical center of the world, th this was profoundly important stuff. And it's in this paper that Hilbert gives the definition of a singularity. Here he's fragment where he's, uh, he's addressing the, um, um, uh, the, the Schreinschild space time. And he gives the definition here uh, of, of what it is for a metric to be regular. And you have the G's that are intertransformable, right? You must have many G's corresponding to what to one of the things that Einstein's calling a, uh, calling a tensor. There has to be a reversible one-to-one -one transformation between them, right? Uh, and they have to be continuous uh, and arbitrarily often differentiable, not analytic, he says only mathematicians want that, not physicists, uh, and have a determinant different from G. That's the condition, and you know that. Then that's then the standard definition that's picked up by everyone. It's in. It's you know everyone's using this. Um, he's already applied this. This is the the Schreinschel, uh line element. He's already a, a, a applied it there, and he has. And he's saying that um, under this condition, you do indeed have a singularity uh, at the um, um, at the Schreinschel radius, and also, by the way, at the origin of coordinates. Right. Uh, it's been consistent. It's at the origin of coordinates. Now, now you're thinking, Göttingen, this was the locus of the greatest mathematical minds. Someone, someone must have sensed that there was something fishy going on here. Um, um, who else is there who could possibly figure this out? 
Um, maybe the greatest geometer, living geometer of the age, might have figured this out. Who's the greatest living geometer of the age? Well, it's Felix Klein. Felix Klein of the Erlangen program of the 19th century, who drew together all of geometry uh, under the idea of projective geometry and the like. And of course, that's exactly what happens. So here's Felix Klein, colleague of, of Hilbert at, at, at Göttingen. He gets interested uh, in the De Sitter space time. He's also written earlier on Minkowski space time. Why is he picking these? Well, he's an expert on homogeneous spaces, on the geometry, on homogeneous geometry. And these are the homogeneous cases. So he knows, he knows how to handle this stuff. So he writes, he writes a paper on this. Right? It's a lengthy, complicated paper. But towards the end, he says the thing, well, it's here in German, he says the thing that you're thinking, well, someone must have said this. Didn't someone say, yes, here it is. Here's, here's, here's he saying it. For the, you know, he's now talking about the singularity here, right? Uh, when you use standard coordinates on, a, on the De Sitter hyperboloid. Uh, um, uh, he says, there's no singularity present other than that of the polar angle at the origin of the common polar coordinate system. It's just like when you've got the, yeah, you know, Ah, someone's finally said it. Um, he's in correspondence with Einstein. So how does Einstein react? Well, he, re he reacts, you know, he, he just brushes it off because he already knew this. Right? We've already seen the evidence. He knew about the full hyperbola. He knew the way that the coordinates there go. And so he explains, frankly, in, in a rather patient offhand manner, um, uh, what, what's wrong with this. And so here's, here's his reply uh, to uh, to uh, to to Klein, he says, yeah, you're right, the sitter's world, he means the full hyperbola, is in itself free of singularity and all the world points are equivalent. Yeah, yeah uh, he, he, he knows all that. But he says, the line element that I'm working with, right, represents something different in the sense of analysis cetus, all right? Um, so he, he, he's telling Klein, yes, correctly, uh, in the full hyperboloid, the surfaces of constant T are meeting at the point that we're that we're calling uh, a, a singularity, but that's just one way of doing the of doing the geometry. In my expression, I am treating all the different T coordinates of that of that uh, for those variables as being distinct uh, as as being distinct events. Right. So let me, let me go and draw the picture here. So the constant T surfaces all intersect there. That's that's Klein's view. Uh, Einstein says no, right? He's you know you, you can do with mathematics what you will. I'm just I'm just using this hyperbola as a way of generating this expression, and I'm stipulating that I'm interested in the case, right? I'm interested in in the case uh, in which the T surfaces don't all intersect. That 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 the events remain. Uh, remain distinct. Now it's weird because the coefficient of the metric there is vanishing. So if you trace along a line there, right, uh, no time will will elapse. But that's the singular character of of the uh, uh, of the whole story. So I tried to draw a picture of it that was a little bit better. I've written a long paper on this. You can pull it out. So if that's the singularity, which is actually a sphere that is enclosing us, um, it is evolving through T, even though no time has no proper time has elapsed. Okay, so would Klein settle for this? A good geometer is he going to is he going to say Einstein? I can't talk to you. Um, you've got a you just got a complete screw loose. Um, this is this is you know this is just hopeless. No, we know exactly what Klein replied because he put it in a paper, and he says, "Oh, I get it. Yeah, I see what you're doing. That's fine." Right. And this is this is you know I'm happy to adopt the understanding that Einstein has expressed in correspondence. Uh, the, the difference in our mutual results must be based on the difference in coordinates used. What I designate as a single point is an extended region. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so um, can we at, at this point say whatever Einstein is doing, it's different from what we do now. It is not a matter of mathematical confusion uh, because he's gotten the approval of two of the greatest living mathematicians of his time, Hilbert who never seemed to doubt it, and Klein has been easily won over. And if the name Hermann Weil means anything to you, Hermann Weil's on Einstein's side as well. See that in, in a moment. So now the key thing is, uh, um, why uh, Why does... I think they believed it, or do you think they just wanted to move right? <laughs> <laughs> No. Have you ever tried to intimidate a mathematician? 
<laughs> there, there, there are other ways of intimidating. No, isn't in parallel this story about Kalusa and Klein not getting, you know, their paper published because Einstein was very keen on pushing that forward. So there were other ways, right? And maybe I look. You guys might be right. It's a matter of further research. I didn't see any evidence that. You know, um, but look, let me keep going. We, we can chat about it later on. So there have to be physical reasons why Einstein prefers that analytic expression over the full hyperboloid. Uh, I, I just mentioned to begin with, um, 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 if you um, if you try and, and and transform back to the full hyperboloid, right, you're violating um, Einstein. Um, you know, the helper definition. You need a many to one back. Right, so you're, you're in trouble there. That's just a, a minor point. Einstein very clearly and repeatedly gives reasons for why he prefers his expression. The difficulty with the uh, uh, descent of hyperboloid is that it's free of matter. And Einstein is fixated at this time on the Mach principle, which says that the metrical properties of space and time are determined by the distribution of matter. So you can't have a space time that has a non trivial geometry uh, without, without there being some. Uh, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some matter present. And the neat thing about this singularity is that it can then turn into uh, uh, a, a, a singular mass distribution, right? And so you would then have uh, this, uh, this sphere that's enclosing this, the singular sphere that's enclosing this would be a mass concentration. And this is the topic that uh, Hermann Weil picked up. He introduced the, the notion of the mass horizon, and he calculated through a limiting procedure that was suggested uh, by Einstein to get to this, uh, uh, to get to this um, um, uh, mass horizon. It's the same thing that's that happened already in the Minkowski space-time. If you keep those points separate, right, if you sort of open up the coordinate system, you think we're going to down to a point, then everything goes kaflowy, and, and you're going to be able to... Uh, uh, um, have masses there. So that, that's the first thing. Right? And then the second thing is Einstein at this time is fixated again on the idea that, 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 um, that the space time is static. Right? And this is a static line element. So the, there are those two reasons. And if you have to do something, use, use that. But then, uh, then, there's more, then, there's more, uh, then there's more to it, there are more problems. We are still in the hyperboloid, just a piece of the hyperboloid. And as you know, the natural motion is for everything to spread apart, right? Um, that's you know, that's the expansion that we we all know so so well in uh, in cosmology. So all the masses of the universe are rushing towards this mass horizon. Makes perfect sense, right? The mass horizon is massive; it ought to be attracting things. So everything's rushing or rushing away from us. But Einstein in 1910 said, "But look, but, you know, but matter is static, right? It doesn't it doesn't go anywhere." So I prefer, he says. My 1917, um, uh, I, I, you know, I prefer the, my 1917 uh, cosmology still. Footnote, is, it's all going to change uh, in the 20s with the discovery of the expansion of the nebulae. Um, um, Einstein and Sidney get together, and, and the two of them together in 32 write a paper in which Einstein retracts uh, 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 all of this. So we do now just give an essentially similar, similar analysis for what's going on in the Minkowski space time. I'm going to hurry on a little bit here uh, just to, you know, just to, so I can get to what I, what I think is more interesting. What we see as a single point where all of these T surfaces meet, Einstein sees as a point that's extended in, in time. Um, uh, there's no, no proper time elapsing along there, but, but um, it has a mass concentration. That's the thing that we... Uh, that we saw him calculating earlier on, uh, and then it makes sense that uh, it, you know uh, this is a this is a geodesic of the Minkowski space time. This is what it looks like if you draw it in these coordinates. And in this part here, it's parabolic. These are masses falling towards uh, uh, towards the um, um, uh, towards that, that singularity. This is an old idea. This was the beginning of general relativity. This was the argument of Einstein in 1907. Only this this portion here when he introduced the principle of, of, of equivalence. Okay, similar story going on with the Schwarzschild space time. Um, I won't say too much more about that because there's less source material. Early on, Einstein just didn't think about this part here. Uh, he regarded the exterior Schwarzschild solution outside of the 
Schwarzschild radius as the thing that mattered. The expected matter theory, some sort of matter theory would take over. Uh, we have some evidence that he really hadn't thought about it. In the early 1920s, he, he gives a, uh, he's in a colloquium at the Collège de France and the mathematician Jacques Hadamard asks him, but what would happen if, if this singularity were realized in, in the world? And Einstein's clearly shocked and doesn't know what to say. He says it would be a, I think a metal, uh, it's the French uh, great catastrophe. It's called, called the, um, the Hadamard catastrophe. And Einstein has to come back. I mean, he's got to he's got to come back a few days later and say, well, what I mean is this: another matter theory would take over, and this is what Schwarzschild calculated in in, in 1916. Is that, is that what you think is the basis of this? That Einstein just didn't think that black holes could exist? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Well, that... In 1939, you've got the Oppenheimer and Snyder paper, which kind of conclusively yeah. shows that can do that. And this paper came out the same year. Yeah, so this, I haven't talked about that paper yet. I'm just about to oh. tell you. Okay. Um, Einstein wrote lots of terrific papers, um, but if we had to find a candidate for the worst paper he ever wrote, <laughs> it's this one. Uh, at the same time as that's happening, Einstein's publishing a paper in which he argues that black holes can't form by gravitational collapse. And he assumes he's got all the masses moving in circles. And as they get closer and closer, they go faster and faster. And they'd have to go faster than the speed of light. And you know, do I need to tell you why that's that's a bad argument that uh, uh, that, that that doesn't work? Let me let me move on a bit because I, I want to finish. And I, there's a bit more to say about Einstein Rosen bridges, and they they they're, they're kind of fun, and we all we all know about that. Einstein and Rosen had a slightly different view about it. Uh, what I oh, went a little faster than I thought. What I, what I want to talk about is um, is, is this: Is Einstein just inventing this weird this weird way of of moving, right? You know, uh, deprecating the geometry, uh, elevating the analytic uh, uh, expressions. And the short answer is no, he's not. He's simply following an existing tradition. The tradition we now think of is this tradition in differential geometry. It starts out with Gauss. Right, uh, of curved surfaces. There's Riemann's famous inaugural address. I take you've you've all seen that cited as the locus classicus for Riemannian geometry. Um, has anyone actually read it? Um, because I'll tell you the weird thing. We talk about why this is weird. What's not in there is the expression that Riemann is most famous for, and that is the Riemann uh, tensor. It's actually not in there, and why it's not in there is is, is actually relevant to the story. And then I just wanted to pick a nice endpoint in this tradition. Uh, Max Lucat um, did a translation of, of Luigi uh, 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 Bianchi's lecture of sort of differential geometry. Okay, that, that's, that's the one we all know, that's, that's fine. But there was a second tradition that was quite distinct. And that tradition um, is a tradition in the invariance of quadratic differential forms. If you look back in the history of mathematics, there's this quite separate strand Right? And it is a purely algebraic um, uh, tradition. Uh, one of the founding papers is due to this guy, Christoffel, uh, the same guy as the Christoffel symbols. This is the paper in which the Christoffel symbol appears. And, the, and what we call the Riemann tensor, the Riemann curvature tensor, the Riemann Christoffel tensor is introduced here as a four index symbol. So he lays out what the project is. And the project is you start with a quadratic differential form, right? Uh, and then you have a Another version of that quadratic differential form in, in, in using different variables. Uh, and he asked the basic question, this is the focus of the literature, what are the conditions necessary such that one can be transformed into the other? So you might think if I got some, some fancy differential form here and one that has all constant coefficients, what's the condition that will let me transform uh, one into the other? Now, it's hard not to imagine, well, boy, that has an obvious geometrical um, application, doesn't it? Um, uh, he avoids that all the way through the paper. And it's only right, oops, it's only right at the very end of the paper in the last paragraph says, oh yeah, this might be, this might be useful geometrically and, or, and, and that's it. That's the tradition. It is purely matters of expressions and their transformations. Now, why does this matter? Um, the mathematical source for Einstein's work on general relativity is the Ricci Levici Vita um, uh, uh, review of the absolute differential calculus from uh, from 1900. That's Ricci. I'm sorry, that's Levi. That's uh, uh, Levici Vita, and they operate in the same vein. They aren't presenting a, a, a foundational um, uh, a method for 
differential geometry, they're presenting a general calculus for solving all sorts of different problems, right? And the the geometrical applications are few. They know they know can be applied to geometry. So here's you know. So I, I highlighted these are the this is where the geometry comes in. But they're very clear. We don't we aren't doing geometry. It's just one application, right? Of something that's that's a great deal uh, more general. That's important. Because then when Einstein and Grossman get together in 1912 and 1913 and start preparing the sketch of what will be the, uh, the, the first version of the general theory of relativity, um, Einstein hands over to Grossman the task of working through the mathematical methods. I think you probably know the story. Einstein um, uh, goes to Grossman early on and says, I need to find some, you know, some, some way of dealing with equations uh, uh, that can be transformed by arbitrary uh, transformations of the variables, what have you got for me? Grossman goes to the library, finds the Richie literature feature article, comes back and says, this is it, but uh, you won't like it because the equations are nonlinear, and Einstein says, nonlinear, that's just what I need. Okay, so this is the, the first page of the paper here, and there's a reason why he wants nonlinear, we can we can talk about that, but that's, that's right. And so this is the, the mathematical part, Madame Machetail, and here, um, Grossman is going through all the methods. It's very familiar and very Einstein-like. It's a template for all of Einstein's later um, uh, discussion. Uh, and this is the end of the introductory section. And he says this, I have deliberately set aside geometrical aids since in my opinion, they contribute little to the intuitive understanding of the formation of concepts of vector analysis. So he's telling us, you know, it's no accident that there's no geometry here. Uh, uh, Grossman has consciously uh, written it all out. Okay, I want to. And do you think that that's be because of reading the Levi Civita top generalized calculus that sees geometry only as a specialized application? I don't know. It's plausible. <laughs> uh, I mean, he, he is in a tradition here, right? It's, you know, uh, Chris Offel's laid the groundwork for this. Um, it's actually in, in Riemann as well. Uh, that's, that was the tease that I. That I, that I dropped earlier on. No, I, I don't know, but, it, but it's a good, a good conjecture. I want to just say a little bit about singularities, right? Um, just because the status of singularities and theories has, has bounced around a bit, right? And um, uh, and um, it, it's only lately that we we have this focus on them and a mixture of awe and horror, depending on, you know, on, on where you stand. And, and so we need a, a little bit of calibration here. So I looked in the 19th century, and there's very there's no presence of any magnitude of singularity talk in physics. It's in mathematics. It's in it's in curves. It's you know some, some curves have kinks. Uh, and when you're doing linear algebra, you know if the uh, you have a singular transformation, if the if the uh, determinant vanishes, right? But that's not that is a that is an insult to nature. It's just a matter of the particular case. Um, so I, I did find one case Maxwell talks about uh, the singularity uh, if you have a, uh, a symmetric electrostatic field, it comes down to a point. And he talks through it without any real sense of a uh, great disaster. Uh, in the early 20th century, Einstein curiously um, is playing around with singularities. He's trying to solve the, uh, the quantum problem. And in 1909, he has this conjecture that maybe uh, light pointer are singularities of the electromagnetic field. Um, I didn't find anybody else who was really playing around with singularities other than this guy, Gustav Mie, who developed a, what was in his time a very influential theory of matter. Hilbert included it in his uh, Foundations of Physics paper, and he spent a lot of time trying to get rid of singularities. All this changes by the time of Einstein's 1935 uh, Einstein and Rosen's paper. This has been brewing all the way through. Einstein is a, has decided that there's a real problem uh, with singularities. And they're very clear about what the problem is. A singularity brings so much arbitrariness into the theory that it actually null nullifies its laws. And then there's a statement here that's repeated over and over and over again. For decades in Einstein's work, you find so many versions of this. Every field theory, in our opinion, must therefore adhere to the fundamental principle that singularities of the field are to be excluded. Now, nowadays, you know, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I know why, because the theory breaks down there. We can't have theories that are breaking down, right? And it would be very easy for Einstein just to say that, but that isn't what he says. 
it, it's really rather intriguing. He goes off in a quite different direction as to why he doesn't like singularities. And it was not what I expected, by the way. I thought, yeah, he's just going to say, they, you, know, you know, the theory breaks down. That's a bad thing. We can't have that, can we? But no, he, he doesn't say that at all. Uh, so um, Einstein, um, in his later years, became very explicit that he doesn't want any kind of arbitrariness in, in physical theories. All right, so this is one manifestation that comes out of his autobiographical notes. He wants no arbitrary constants in a physical theory. All right, um, and once you realize and look for it, you can see this, uh, this aversion to arbitrariness going all the way back to the beginning. It was buried, right? The Mach principle, for those of you who've been following it, um, he argues against it on the basis, uh, he argues for it rather on the basis of the arbitrariness of assuming inertial spaces, right? I don't know that Einstein then realized the importance of this elimination of, of, of arbitrariness, but, but it, it kind of remains all the way through. And that's the problem, he says, with singularities, right? So it took me a while to find this, but this is a very late piece in the meaning of relativity, the thing that's closest to a textbook, written right at the end of his life. And he says, singularities must be excluded because they introduce arbitrariness in the same way that boundary conditions introduce arbitrariness. So think about uh, what you do with a boundary condition. You use a boundary condition to narrow down the, the, the space of solutions that you're considering. If you have a singularity, you can pull the same trick. I mean, you know, the simplest example is Schwarzschild solution you can put in any M, right? And that's an arbitrariness that you, that you put in by hand. And this, he says, it's, is what, um, um, uh, uh, is what is objectionable about singularities. Okay, I want to I want to conclude. Um, so what do we what do we think? What do you think about this guy? I've I mean I I've, I've been trying to figure out. Um, is there can can someone tell me how I should think about this? And then I realized that Einstein's already told me how I should think about this. Uh, in his uh, autobiographical notes, there's this wonderful moment where he pauses and reflects back on Newton, right? Newton, the guy, he's just, you know, made a mess of all Newton's stuff. So, so does he say, Newton, doofus, what can we say, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, you know, you should have done better, you know, um, but oh well. Uh, no, he doesn't say that. He says enough of this, and I'd say this is what we should say about Einstein. He says enough of this, Newton, forgive me. You found the only way which in your age was just about possible for a man of the highest thought and creative power. The concepts which you created are even today still guiding our thinking in physics, although we now know that they will have to be replaced by others farther removed from the sphere of immediate experience if we aim at a profounder understanding of relationships. Yeah, I think that's quite. I've enjoyed our brief moments together. <laughs> Thank you very much. If, if this has been enough for you, um, I understand. But if you are eager, eager for more, uh, please go to my website and uh, you'll find all of this laid out in a manuscript that I just posted there a few uh, a few days ago. And I went on six minutes longer than I planned, I apologize. Do you want to take that? I, I think I'd rather you feel. Do you mind? No, no. Okay. Um, so. Uh, hi, thanks for the, the talk. I, I was curious. Uh, you said that uh, Einstein's thinking was kind of in line with the tradition at the time, but uh, by the time he was rewriting that 1939 manuscript, it was it seemed to be different from uh, how he thought about things. So, what, what do you think changed? Um, in the tradition or in Einstein? Einstein didn't change. No, no, no. the tradition. What changed in the tradition? I don't know. Um, um, my, I haven't looked at this in great detail. It's a later history that I haven't worked. But my impression is that things really start to change in the 60s when mathematical physicists like, you know, um, you know Hawking and Garrosh and people like that start taking a serious interest. You, you guys probably have a long enough memory to, to know to know better. Um, you've got to remember that around this time, uh, there's what Jean Eisenstadt called the low watermark in relativity. 
um, remember what's happening in the larger, you know, in, 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 you know, in the larger scene of things. There's a there's a war. It completely overturns the the physics community. All of the focus and interest goes into wartime activities. The Manhattan Project takes off. Quantum theory is absolutely dominant. Relativity, general relativity is a kind of a backwater that no one's paying a tremendous amount of attention to. It's only really in the 60s that it gets that it gets revived. But that's, you know, I haven't worked the history of that period. And I'm, I'm guessing some of you here surely must have. No, no one's going to help me. I, I stand here alone and floundering. <laughs> Well, the, the event that you're thinking of in Minkowski space time, you know, it, it's just a single event. He's replaced that by a linear continuum of events at, at which the, um, uh, the coefficients of the metric take on, uh, you know, zero and in, in, in infinite values, depending on, on which ones that you're looking at. So remember the calculation I described. You then take that metric and plug it into the Einstein equations and see what stress energy tensor comes out. The problem you have is if you plug in, you know, zeros and infinities, uh, you know, you can't put that into the Riemann uh, tensor. So, so what? So what they do? This is in the paper. What they do is they um, is they 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 take a deviation from uh, uh, from that uh, metric which has the uh, uh, which has the zeros and infinities at that one event. I can't remember the formula. But the formula is uh, in, in the paper. Uh, and such that when you let a parameter go to some limiting value, then you would get zeros, but they hold off. They don't let the parameter go to the limiting values. They then plug that into the, into the Einstein equation, read off what the stress energy tensor is, and find, if I recall correctly, that it's the two, three uh, coefficients uh, are, going to, are going to diverge. That's how they do it. But, but the key thing is you're still thinking of... Um, um, the x1 is zero um, a coordinate as labeling a single event, right? They're thinking of that as labeling many events with different t's, with different x4 coordinates. And so the mathematics they're going to do is just going to be, is going to be different and, and messy. D does that help? I mean, it's, it's what they did. That's your conjecture. Um, and he changed the geometry. Yeah. The geometry is the, the point has been blown up into a line. Yeah. And on that geometry, the metric has a delta function wire. Yeah. I, 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 I will admit, I, I didn't try to reconstruct the calculation. Um, I just assumed Einstein and Rosen together probably wouldn't blow the algebra. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, think about it. It's, it's not going to be an easy calculation to do. So I. You know, I always screw up calculations anyway because I drop it on Mathematica today. Oh, well, yeah, would you let me know? Seriously, I, 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 I mean, one of the anomalies is the way they write the final expression is actually ambiguous, and it took me forever to figure out where to put the parentheses so that you actually get the result that they say. <laughs> uh, there's a question. Yes, we have a question from Netta. Uh, yeah, hi. Can everyone hear me? Thank yes. You. Great. Um, yeah, so our modern understanding of singularities is much closer to topological than geometric. Uh, we can accommodate things like uh, an excise point in the middle of the space-time or excise part of the space-time or a singularity, which is uh, not one which is a curvature singularity, but nevertheless, it's in terms of geodesic incompleteness. Um, of course, this understanding dates back to the Hopfrenow theorem. But I was wondering what, you, uh, what your thoughts were on this very different way of thinking about singularities, which is really the modern crux of how we talk about singularities in general relativity? Um, it's kind of you to ask, but it's outside of my expertise. So especially in this room, I'm very loath to, <laughs> to, to express an opinion. Will you forgive me if I, if I leave it at that? Yes, yeah, sure. 
My question was about uh, Einstein's notion of intuition, which comes up in several of the quotations that you had here. And uh, it was it was Gross it was Grossman it was um, uh, Frelmish kind of thing. Sorry, what 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 were you? Uh, um, uh, you know, Einstein often uses Anschaulichkeit. Is that the word? That he uses? I don't know. Um, Anschaulich. Uh, yeah, for yeah, there yeah. you go. So that, there, that, there that, is that, a that. kind of visual aspect to Shaolin's book on, right? And, right. Um, and intuition is something he discusses from earliest days till latest days. I was interested in in the, in the remark that, he, that Einstein makes that you quoted of, of him saying that the, the formal or, or, or sort of algebraic formulation gives us better, or, or the geometry doesn't give us uh, and, and improved intuition. And yes, I, I wanted to know to... whether, uh, having gone through these papers and thought about the kind of formal representation that he wants, the, the, the formal calculus in the tradition of Riemann through um, and Christoffel and, 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 uh, and Lady Sabita, do you have a, a sense of what, um, a, a sense of the, Intuition that he's after, what he wants, what he means. Um, no, um, I'm struggling to think of cases where he uses the expression. You're probably right, but they haven't stuck in my in my head. Um, um, this is this is a negative here yeah. against the geometrical conception. Um, we can talk about that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, again, um, you guys are asking better questions than I have answers. Apologize. Great talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for a uh, for a great talk, Amber. Um, uh, the uh, the the uh, the comments about uh, Newton that you showed at the end I find it particularly striking and confusing because 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 he he knew right what to do about you know uh, Newton's theory I and mean, it failed you know, to be replaced by something else. And that's you know that's striking because it it is conflicting with his viewpoint about singularities, like something that ought to be removed in a physical theory altogether. I mean the modern point of view is that singular is that pointing towards you know the fact that a theory needs to be replaced with something else with a method theory that describes that situation closer to the singular regime. So he kind of knew the answer yeah. to, you know, to, to, you know, the modern way of treating singularities uh, in his, you know, kind of letter to, to Newton. But did you have, do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, um, that the attitude you described as singularities is actually really very close to Einstein's attitude. Uh, so he didn't think about the Schwarzschild radius and things inside it because he assumed that a matter theory would take over there, right? And um, he used singularities as surrogates for matter distributions. We saw the same thing happening in the Descent of Space Time. And there's a whole other part to the story that I, I wondered if anyone was going to bring up. Uh, in the 1930s, um, uh, Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman uh, follow a completely different trajectory. <laughs> Right, um, they they want to try and figure out, uh, uh, you know, can you recover the equations of motion for a mass point, right, from the Einstein equations alone without needing to posit the geodesic equation, and so um, Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman uh, follow up on something that Einstein has started with Gromer, uh, one one of his assistants in the 1920s, uh, and they they're looking for uh, what singularities would do, right, uh, in a uh, um, uh, in, in, in Einstein's theory. Um, uh, so, so this idea that the singularities are pointers to, you know, to an as yet undiscovered matter theory, uh, that was all the way around. Um, and other parts in Hilbert's Grundlage of Deficy, that's the attitude that he takes, uh, that he takes to these singularities. Uh, this gives me a chance then to say something I thought I, I wouldn't have time for in the talk. So, but wait, wait a minute, Einstein hates singularities and wants to get rid of them. What on earth is he doing in Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman, <laughs> right? In, in putting in singularities. Well, he's a he's a practical guy. <laughs> so, and, uh, his goal uh, is to get rid of arbitrariness.
but you can't do it in one one swoop. He wants to get, he's doing it in stages, right? Uh, and the big arbitrariness that's bothering him is that you have two equations in general relativity. You've got the Einstein gravitational field equations, right? And you have the geodesic equation as a separate equation. And, and that's an arbitrariness that he doesn't like, and he wants to get rid of that. And if the cost is that he has to, you know, start playing fast and loose with singularities, okay, because you can think of them as surrogates for matter distributions, right? So I'm sure as physicists, you're all very principled and would never adopt um, a strategy like that, but that's, that's what he did. <laughs> Um, yeah. So thank you so much.